my great pleasure to welcome to our 2023 Online Trend Summit, TFP's Head of Insight, Shakifa Hijazi. Shakifa joins us today to talk about how we see the overarching themes within the culinary and gastronomic landscape in particular. Thanks for joining us today again, Shakifa. It's always great to welcome you to TFP's virtual stage. Thanks, Charles. It's great to be back. Just a note to those of you that are joining today, if you're Trend Hub subscribers, you can immerse in uh, what we're calling around the world and the detail behind this presentation in the 2425 Cuisines and Ingredient Predictions on Trend Hub. So without further ado, Shkuba, I'll hand over to you to share with us what that future horizon looks like, specifically through our cuisines, ingredients and gastronomy lens. Great. So let's kick off. Uh, hi, everybody. As Charles has mentioned, I'm here today to talk to you all about all things cuisines and flavors and ingredients. And we've got a lot of delicious things in store. But first things first, those of you who are subscribers to our service, when you log into our online portal, Trend Hub, to check out our annual framework, which I'm sure you'll all do after today, <laughs> you'll see that there's actually an entire dedicated section where we delve into cuisine trends around the world with a particular focus on how those trends are manifesting in the UK, America, and Australia. The Cuisines Framework is an incredibly detailed piece of work in its own right. In fact, we spend thousands of hours as, as a team each year gathering data on how cuisines are evolving around the world. We track dozens of global cuisines at any given point from West African to British to Korean and everywhere in between. Then we hone in on the market appeal and trend setting influence of each of those cuisines, and we create maps that show not just how they're evolving compared to last year, but also how they all sit as against each other. And then we also go a bit of an extra mile by creating detailed charts for each of our focus regions that list out this year's trending flavors and ingredients. Now, in addition to that deep dive work that we do each year, a few sample slides of which have just popped here, we also take a step back to ask a bigger picture question around cuisines. Essentially, we ask ourselves not just what cuisines and dishes are trending globally, but why? And how can we help you as our clients translate that information into new product development? And that's where we lean back into one of our ever trusty trend wheels. That's right, the Cuisines Framework gets its own trend wheel each year, where we hone in on a handful of bigger picture, overarching global cuisine trends. Pictured here um, is actually this year's wheel. And as you can see, just as with our other food and beverage wheel, underpinning our cuisine trends is a core driver, which an answers that all important question of why cuisine trends are as they are right now. And this year, our core driver, as you can see, is around the world. And before we explain what we mean by this sort of central core driver, I should give a little bit of context about the journey to get to this year's center core. Now, those of you who follow our work will know that at TFP, we take cuisines very seriously. We spent nearly two decades, in fact, immersing ourselves, not just in cuisines, but also in, those, in their drivers and influence. And using our expertise, we've broken down the last 130 or so years into cuisine eras, as indicated on this slide. I won't get into the detail of all of these areas for the purpose of today's session, just in the interest of time, but rest assured we delve into all of these and other resources on Trend Hub. But what I will take a moment to explain is the current era that we're in and how this year's core driver fits into that era, which is conscious cuisine. So the era that we're in right now, we call conscious cuisine. And essentially, this means that cooks define themselves by techniques and ideologies, um, broadly speaking, the nine pillars on this slide, rather than strict geographic cuisines. In other words, there are no rules or borders when it comes to cooking, but cooks are careful to balance this no rules, no borders ethos with technique, craft, and consideration for both people and planet, hence the name Conscience Cuisine. Now, that being said, over the last few years, the entire world has faced rather unique and unprecedented challenges. So of course, this approach to cooking has evolved through the Conscience Cuisine era. Indeed, in the first year or two of this era, as brought to life in this diagram, it was all about exploring the core principles of conscious cuisine, creative flair, technique mastery, and sustainability. Then as we go along the diagram, and as we navigated our way through and out of a, plan a global pandemic, flavor and sensory exploration were understandably king. 
But last year, as headlines seemed to be ever brimming with even more doom and gloom, we looked at how the driving force behind cuisine trends was actually the need, above all else, for pure, unadulterated joy through food. And now we get to this year, where the economic and political uncertainties that underpinned last year's centre core have only compounded and intensified. So consumers are still seeking that joy through food, but they're also looking for eating occasions to transport them from their troubles. And I mean really transport them, like to happy, faraway places. For some, those happy places might be a simple meal in an Italian trattoria or a French bistro. For others, it's about going on a food crawl through the hawker centers of Southeast Asia. For others yet, it might just be pulling up a counter seat in a diner and having a slice of pie. But for everybody, it's about using food to forget your troubles and momentarily escape. Well, escape around the world. So with that center core now demystified, let's jump into the fun foodie business of how this is actually manifesting. Basically, what are the delicious things that people are eating and drinking to take them on that journey around the world? Now, of course, you can see on the wheel here that we have 12 cuisine trends in our book. And of course, we have all the information in our maps and charts that I mentioned earlier. And in the interest of time for today's session, obviously we can't walk through all of that. So for the purposes of today, just to give you all a little taster of what's in the framework and on the hub, we've gone ahead and pulled together six big takeouts from the world of cuisines this year, as highlighted on this slide. And rather than try and explain these takeouts up front, I think the best thing for it is to just bring them to life by jumping straight into all of the delicious detail. So without further ado, let's kick off with the first of our cuisine trends, which is safe bet versus splurge. Now, I wanted to kick off with this one because the elephant in the room when it comes to how and what people are eating is the fact that we are living through a cost of living crisis. And this, of course, does have implication when it comes to spending money on food. Diners are budget conscious, essentially. So we're seeing that when they do dine out, they're leaning more towards what we call safe bets, essentially meals that strip away bells and whistles in flavor of guaranteed deliciousness. And affinity for simple, guaranteed delicious food is bolstering two tried and tested favorites, steak and chicken. Indeed, American-style steakhouses are enjoying a renaissance, and so too are simple French-style bistros that serve a handful of simple dishes like steak frites served in the classic way. However, not to be outdone, chicken and chips <laughs> is vying for top spot when it comes to trending meals. After all, what is more comforting than a chicken dinner? And we're talking chicken every way, deep fried, smoked, piri piri style, even nods to classic chicken shop takeaways like they've done at Fowl in London, pictured on the top there. But most of all, classic British roast chicken and French rotisserie. In fact, perennially popular Bob Bob Ricard in London, which is famed for caviar and its press for champagne buttons, recently launched a new sister site, which serves just one main dish. And it is, you guessed it, whole rotisserie chickens but not just any chickens. These are traditionally farmed free range chickens from Western France, roasted to perfection before being carved table side and served with chicken jus and truffle fries. And before we move on from this trend, I'd be remiss not to mention that it's not all about food service. Home cooks are also rediscovering their love for supermarket rotisserie chickens as a single bird can create multiple midweek meals. For instance, if you shred the meat for salads one night, then tacos the next, and then on day three, make a soup with the leftover bones. But then there's so much more to this trend than just steak and chicken, of course. Indeed, for many, nothing is a safer bet than nostalgic food, whether it reminds us of our own childhood or gives us, gives us a sense of borrowed nostalgia from films and TV. So it's no surprise, really, that cooks are leaning into simple ha handheld formats that really indulge our inner child. And yes, that means burgers, tater tots, chicken tenders, all that good stuff. But what's great is that they're wearing their conscience cuisine hats. And so these cooks are balancing fun and irreverence in those handheld gourmet options with really Michelin grade skill and technique. For instance, I really love the pizza on the top uh, photograph here, which is a play on the classic frozen hot pockets that kids in the States grow up eating. Except this one is from a hot restaurant in New York and it's filled with homemade cacciatore sauce and smoked mozzarella. And you can bet your bottom dollar it's not from Frozen. <laughs> then underneath that, we've got corn dogs. Incidentally, a format we're seeing a lot of thanks to the global obsession with Korean style corn dogs in particular. But here we're seeing the classic American corn dog get a fine dining makeover with house-made truffle ketchup and whiskey mustard. 
It's so good. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> And then I can't leave the section without giving a shout out to hot dogs generally, which are vying to be the go-to street food of this recession. Indeed, popular chef Alex Dupac recently created a bona fide craze around the 29 hot dog at his New York restaurant, Misha, which is a homemade beef and pork dog, picture on the bottom here, that comes with a suite of house-made dips that include brisket chili, brown mustard, habanero bacon crisp, kimchi, and pimento cheese. It's a perfect embodiment of this handheld gourmet movement, food that looks simple, but is made with the same skill, care, and ingredients as a Michelin tasting menu. And speaking of Michelin menus, there is of course the other end of the spectrum. Uh, for those days when a safe bet just won't hit the spot, that's where occasional big splurges are coming in. We aren't talking spending money just so that you have something to post about on social media. Rather, this trend is about blowout meals becoming a real treat again, something that you save up for to enjoy with loved ones on a birthday or a date night or a special occasion. Now, one way this is manifesting is in the renaissance of good old fashioned tableside and trolley service, which I love. <laughs> and it makes sense. After all, crepe Suzette, flambe tableside, or a steak tartare that's chopped and seasoned right before your eyes to your taste is a level of indulgence and personal attention that you simply cannot recreate at your local pizza joint. And of course, it's just fun, which is why restaurants aren't just doing classic trolleys, they're also doing sort of tongue in cheek things like creating bespoke butter boards or customized Knickerbocker glories tableside. And in that same vein, it's that level of hyper special personal attention that's also driving a resurgence in Japanese style omakase dining. Essentially tasting menus taken at a chef's counter, which can include 20 plus courses. So you'll be there for a while. Indeed, we're seeing everything from classic Japanese sushi to dedicated tempura tasting menus served this way, as well as modern global twists on the formula, like the example on the bottom here, which is a classic nigiri, but it's finished with bacon jam, barbecue glaze, and a cornichon in a contemporary omakase. That sounds amazing. I know. <laughs> it's really like mouth-watering stuff, isn't it? <laughs> And the key is that, you know, this is really food for special occasions rather than the everyday. And although that's great, that does leave the question of, OK, that's how cooks can introduce you to cuisines and big blowout meals. But how can we do it for diners in sort of more accessible day to day ways? And that's actually where our next trend comes in, which is fusion fast casual. Now, one thing I should mention for context is that we're actually seeing a boom in general for QSR and fast casual outlets because against the backdrop of a recession, which we are sort of living through, the channel presents a brilliant value proposition. So we're seeing a lot of new fast casual players coming through and lots of foodie innovation across the channel generally, including the introduction of global favors and ingredients to fast food favorites. And no format is a better vehicle for those flavor twists than everybody's favorite burger and fries, or maybe that's just my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's exactly the reason that the 2008 recession contributed so much to the rise of the gourmet burger, because the classic bread meat bread formula is just a perfect blank canvas. Yeah. So the question is, what are QSR and fast casual outlets doing now to up, up the ante on their burgers this time around? Well, for starters, lots of them are leaning on Middle Eastern pantry staples like za'atar, dukkah, and tahini, as well as dips and condiments like harissa yogurt or zub, which is a sort of herbaceous, fiery green condiment, tum, which is a garlic sauce, and amber, which is one of my favorites, the pickled mango hot sauce. These are being used more and more widely, not just because there's established appetite for these flavors, but also because they are super versatile and lots of them can be used in combination. In a similar vein, we're also seeing lots of use of Indian spices and sauces and burgers that are mashed up with Indian dishes. For instance, I have to admit, I'm absolutely obsessed with the idea of the Indian butter chicken burger and poutine pitched on the top of this slide here, which Burger King actually launched as an LTO in Canada recently. And perhaps most excitingly, it's not all about using well-known cuisine elements here. Cooks are also using burgers as a vehicle to introduce diners to cuisines that might be new to them like those of West Africa. For instance, I absolutely love, love, love the special edition burger that Shake Shack recently launched with West African dining hotspot, uh, fine dining hotspot Ikoi, which is pictured on the bottom here. It's a burger topped with scotch bonnet relish, ifo spice, mustard greens, and pumpkin seed miso. And then to sort of put the cherry on top, <laughs> it's served with a side of crinkle cut fries drenched in dark beer fondue. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about a death row meal there. It is amazing. I would want that every day. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great, great spot. I completely missed that. Um, that LTA. I, how many days was that around? Not not very long, I guess. I didn't. Well, see the, the 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 Akoi, um lot. I mean, I think it was literally one day only. So it was. <laughs> Looks incredible. But it made, but it, it managed to make waves way beyond that because it was so exciting for people to see the ways that these flavors and ingredients that might be new to them could incorporate so beautifully and seamlessly with a format that is actually really familiar to them. Yeah. Then again, of course, it's not all about things like burgers and fries in the fast casual sphere. I can't talk about familiar format <laughs> in this area without mentioning, of course, pizza, since it ticks so many boxes. It's arguably the ultimate comfort food. It's great for feeding a family on a budget, and it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant canvas for cooks to introduce diners to those global cuisines. The examples on this slide are just meant to bring this to life because they just capture the breadth of possibility here br brilliantly. There's a Mexican elote pizza on the top, which is topped with grilled corn, tahine spice, chipotle aioli, and aged cotillo cheese. Then there's sort of South Asia meets Italy in the guise of a pizza from yard sale recently, which is topped with karahi lamb kima, and then a pot of writer sauce on the side for dipping. And last but not least, a Filipino twist on Detroit style pizza, complete with pork sisig, which is a sort of sizzling stir fry made with pork and offal that's tossed in a sour spicy marinade. And actually, this deep dish pie is a really nice way to segue onto the next section of today's trends, where we look at Gourmet American. Now, the global obsession with all things Americana is not new per se. It's been a few years now that diners have just been lapping up the likes of Detroit style pizza, smash burgers, Nashville hot chicken and s'mores. But what's really interesting now um, is that the better versed people become in those American foods, the more they want to know about the tradition and diversity of its food cultures that they might not have known about before. Now, one thing we're seeing a lot of are nods to decades and even centuries old food traditions and recipes, particularly those from Southern American states. It's really all about food that makes you think of simpler times when home cooks could work their magic with simple staple ingredients like rice, flour, potatoes, lard, <laughs> minced meat, tinned soup, bologna, all that kind of stuff. So we're seeing a lot more of dishes like biscuits and gravy, hush puppies, chicken pot pie, and meatloaf outside of the States. But what's really exciting is, that, again, these dishes are getting that same gourmet treatment as any haute cuisine meal. As you can see from the example in the middle of the slide here, where a humble meatloaf is elevated to sort of gastronomic status with the help of mustard sauce, grilled plums, and watercress. And I'd be remiss to talk about American food or American comfort food without giving a nod to all the sweet formats that lend themselves perfectly to this approach. Think gooey chocolate chip cookies, deep fried beignets in the sort of New Orleans style, New York style cheesecake, and of course, pie every which way. I mean, cherry, apple, chocolate, key lime, they're all things we're seeing a lot of. And one old school favorite that we're seeing tons is banana cream pie, like the one pictured here, um, which is actually sort of twisted and elevated with the addition of passion fruit, creme fraiche chantilly, and fried pecans. And speaking of old school, another sort of facet of American dining, which is really driving its popularity at the moment that I wanted to mention, is the appeal of diners and luncheonettes that serve up sort of soup, sandwiches, and other simple but delicious plates. Now, this one shouldn't come as a surprise because it's driven by the cost of living crisis, of course, as consumers are on the hunt for good quality food that won't break the bank. In fact, one, th one thing we are seeing a lot more of are daily discount blue, uh, meals, sometimes called blue plate specials, um, like the one pictured here, where the food changes, but the price stays fixed and affordable every day. But the diner and luncheonette resurgence is also to do with a general trend that we're seeing towards casualization. It's a sort of mouse twister <laughs> casualization in dining. Now, there's a time and place for tasting menus and trolley side, trolleys and tableside service, as we've seen. But day to day, consumers do want those simple comforts. That means things like club sandwiches or chicken noodle soup, but taken to new gourmet heights, like the example um, on the top of this slide here, where the classic grilled cheese and tomato soup formula is given a vegan Korean makeover. Mm -hmm. Or the banana split, which is deconstructed so that you can customize it as you go for added fun. And speaking of simple but delicious comforts and all that good stuff, that leads us quite nicely onto our next cuisine trend 
which is Italian, or more specifically, the next wave of Italian cuisine. Because of course, in the last couple of years, we've already seen consumers really doubling down on Italian for a few reasons. First, there's the fact that so many staples of Italian cuisine are fuss-free, ingredient-led dishes that really lend themselves to comforting, budget-friendly meals. And those same factors are, of course, still a massive draw this year. But global obsession with Italian cuisine is going next level, not least because shows like White Lotus and Stanley Tucci's Searching for Italy have all of us daydreaming about, you know, Roman pizza crawls or leisurely meals on the Amalfi Coast. So the better people get to know Italian cuisine and have those daydreams about those, you know, long, leisurely Italian lunches, the more they seek out real, authentic regional dishes. Things like bistecca alla Fiorentina, Neapolitan pizza fritta, or cheese and pomodoro topped Sicilian focaccia, like the one pictured on this slide here. And in that same sort of carb driven vein, other comfort dishes, but rustic, authentic ones shine too. Stuff like nocco frito stuffed with a good homemade mortadella, or fresh baked ciabatta filled with spicy sausage and scamorza cheese, like the sandwich pictured on the bottom. And one thing that's super exciting for those with a sweet tooth in this area is that traditional Italian go-tos like tiramisu and affogato are making way for lesser known but equally delicious regional delights like delizia limone or Amalfi lemon de delight, pastiera, which is a ricotta tart, maritozzi, which are those cream-filled brioche buns that are probably littering your Instagram feeds already at the moment, <laughs> or veneziana, which are delicious custard buns. Then again, modern Italian cuisine on the global scene isn't all about these sort of authentic regional dishes. It's also about contemporary modern global takes, which diners also can't get enough of. American Italian cuisine, for instance, just continues to go from strength to strength with the likes of meatball subs, chicken parm, sort of hundred layer lasagna, fried provolone served with vodka sauce. In fact, vodka sauce on everything. <laughs> Indeed, one of the hottest tables you can get at the moment in New York is at a restaurant that's actually called Bad Roman, um, <laughs> quite apt, because they serve dishes like this fillet steak topped with a giant cacio pepe ravioli, as well as ridiculously tasty, tasty sounding things like garlic babka in lieu of traditional garlic bread, and even fried pepperoni cups that they serve straight up as an appetizer with ranch sauce to dip. And that's, speaking of, <laughs> I know, sign me up, right? <laughs> Uh, and speaking of pepperoni, I've included the example in the middle of the slide to show how the Italian influence is also having a real impact on the cocktail world. This one is a Negroni made with gin that's actually washed in pepperoni fat. Yeah, that's right. But we're also seeing all sorts of Italian takes on classic cocktails with everything from caprese martinis made with um, vodka infused with tomato and basil oil on top or rosemary and fennel margaritas. And I can't leave the section without also mentioning one Italian cuisine trend that is really shaking up the wider food world. And that's the massive proliferation we're seeing in Asian Italian mashups, in particular Japanese and Korean takes on Italian classics. That means things like gochujang ragu or udon carbonara, of course, but look out also for Korean tteokbokki, uh, which are the cylindrical rice cakes you can see pictured on the bottom of this slide that are being used in lieu of traditional pasta for everything from a bolognese to a vongole. And last but not least, a shout out also to the really exciting new wave of Indian Italian that's coming through. We already saw this to some extent with that pizza I mentioned earlier, which was topped with lamb kima and served with rice sauce on the side. But it's really just the tip of the iceberg, as we're seeing cooks really throw the rule book out the window to create dishes like malai rigatoni or tandoori spaghetti. And actually, all that talk of pasta and Italian food leads us quite nicely onto the next and penultimate trend that I wanted to look at today, which is the medway. That's right, despite all the talk out there around new age diets and lifestyle, the good old fashioned Mediterranean diet has quietly been regaining favor. And it's for like for a number of reasons. 
It's something we actually delve into a lot in the wider trends framework, but a big driver behind it is the growing backlash against ultra processed foods and conversely, the long term health benefits of a balanced nutrient dense diet. Now, bolstered by longevity research and shows like Blue Zones on Netflix, which explores where and how people live into their hundreds, we're ever more aware that what we eat now can really impact how long, but also how well we live. Because of this, we're seeing the Mediterranean diet come back into the limelight which advocates for a balanced, pragmatic approach and incorporates lots of whole grains, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. It champions the rule of thumb that plates should be colorful and diets diverse, but crucially, it doesn't malign things like meat, cheese, and dairy. Instead, it follows a really important everything in moderation approach, which means that there's a place for the likes of, you know, proper good quality cheese, yogurt, milk, and eggs, as well as good fats like unprocessed olive oil. It also sets a place at the table for meat and fish, particularly oily varieties like the sardines pictured here or the tin fish that a lot of us have sitting in the cupboard. This way of eating is really striking a chord with diners who feel you know, stressed and drained with everything that we've been living through and increasingly wanna take a positive holistic approach to eating to live longer, but also better. Then again, of course, it's not just lifespan that's driving the popularity of Mediterranean eating, although that's a good benefit. It's also the fact that it gives us straight up holiday vibes. <laughs> After all, who doesn't want to eat a meal that transports them to a pincho bar in San Sebastian? <laughs> Indeed. To that, yeah, to that end, Spanish picky bits and tapas are a big draw at the moment. Things like pan con tomate, but you know, done really, really well with homemade bread, good olive oil, garlic. Gambas al ajillo, patatas bravas, and of course, croquetas. There's also lots of things on bread, <laughs> whether it's a slice of tortilla on a piece of toast or fresh cheese and sweet red prawns in the style of Mountain Restaurant in London, which we've put here. And one simple stunner that we're seeing absolutely everywhere at the moment is the Spanish style gilda skewer, which is typically done like the one picture at the top here, where a toothpick is skewered with an anchovy, a pickled pepper and an olive and served as a simple snack with a nice you know, glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, where do I sign up? I didn't know it was called a gilda skewer though. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds as good as it looks. Yeah. <laughs> and while we're on this topic, I also wanted to just give a shout out to Spain's Iberian neighbor, Portugal, which is starting to make waves on the global gastronomic scene as well. Now, hands up, of course, we know that Portugal does not technically have a Mediterranean coastline, <laughs> Um, but it is often associated as Mediterranean, not least because it shares the same climate and lifestyle as its Med-facing neighbours. So we're including it here and do want to flag that we're seeing a lot more of traditional Portuguese favourites like piri piri chicken, of course, but also salt cod fritters and feijoada, which is like a bean stew, as well as contemporary takes on classics like the Lisbon style custard tart that's pictured on the bottom of this slide. Then again, if neither Spanish or Portuguese is your thing, uh, another Mediterranean holiday destination is making a very big impact on the food scene, and that is Greece. Now, anyone who watched Blue Zones, as I did, and I know Charles, you did as well, didn't you? Um, will remember, of course, that Ikaria in Greece was flagged as one of the world's longevity Blue Zones. Yeah. And one of the big factors behind this was that the typical Ikarian diet consists of lots of herbal tea, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, potatoes, and olive oil. But crucially, Ikarians are also touted for understanding that life is about balance and enjoyment. And yes, that even means the occasional glass of red wine and a late night party. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the appeal of not just Ikarian, but Greek cuisine generally. It's gaining momentum because diners just can't get enough, again, of that ingredient-led, simple, paired-back, rustic approach of dishes like souvlaki, moussaka, or spanakopita. And dips really also shine here. We all know about hummus and tzatziki, of course, but have a think about things like fava bean puree, terra masalata, and scordalia, which is a potato and garlic dip. And we're also seeing, of course, feta, lots of feta served every which way, whipped, deep fried, sesame crusted, or stuffed into a pita with mint, garlic, and honey, then toasted for a Greek, Greek twist on the classic grilled cheese sandwich, like the one pictured on the bottom here. 
it's the stuff of Mediterranean dreams, my dreams, I have to say. <laughs> but of course, it might not be for everybody. Now, when some people think of being transported to a beach far away, they might think of even further, more tropical climes. And that actually leads us very nicely onto the last cuisine trend for today, explore Southeast Asia. Now, we already know that the cuisines of Southeast Asia are big players on the global food scene, with Thailand and Vietnam arguably leading the charge with dishes like pad thai, green curry, pho, and summer rolls, which have become part of the sort of mainstream foodie lexicon in countries like the UK and Australia and the USA. But what's really exciting at the moment is that with these cuisines being established foodie fix fixtures in those places, now cooks are twisting up classic staples, as well as delving into hyper-regional and even city-specific fare. For instance, I've included the example on the top because it's from one of my favorite restaurants, actually, Speedboat Bar, which is a bustling London restaurant that doesn't call itself Thai. It actually models itself on the late night canteen specifically of Bangkok's Chinatown which means you don't come here for pad thai, you come for Bangkok style fried chicken skins, cellophane noodles and suki sauce, tom yum mama, or pineapple pie with taro ice cream. Not to be outdone though, it's not all about Thai <laughs> or Bangkok style. The other vibrant, fragrant, fragrant and diverse cuisines of Southeast Asia are becoming better and better known outside of the region. In particular, we're talking about Indonesia, which is being lauded for its satay, lumpia, which are spring rolls essentially, and sambal, which is a brilliant fiery condiment. Malaysia, with cult dishes like rendang, nasi goreng, kuei tiao, rice noodles, and of course, roti for dipping up, for mopping up lots of good sauce. And then there's Singapore, whose hawker centers are a melting pot of all of these cuisines, with some Chinese and Indian influences thrown in for good measure too. But if we're talking about trending Southeast Asian cuisines, we've got to finish by talking about the Philippines, as Filipino is emerging as a brilliant new it cuisine, thanks to ingredients like purple ube, banana ketchup, and panda sal bread rolls, which are becoming more and more mainstream, as well as dishes like adobo, which is a sort of meat cooked in vinegar and spices, kinalaw, which is a um, fish cured in citrus and vinegar, kind of like a ceviche, Lechon, which is roasted pork, and longanisa, which are sausages, which, which you can see an example of on the top of this slide, served with fried egg and rice at Kuya Lord, which is a Filipino restaurant that's become one of LA's hottest dining destinations. And make sure you leave some room for Filipino dessert too. <laughs> if you're after something traditional, there's Halo Halo, which is a cold dessert usually served in a cup consisting of layers of shaved ice, condensed milk, and customizable extras like ube ice, ube ice cream, jellies, flan, or fruit chunks. Or you can take a leaf out of Abby Bellingit's book, Mayumu, which has made waves with its reimagined Filipino-American desserts, like the adobo chocolate chip cookies I've included on this slide here, that are taken to new flavor-bending heights, I have to say, with the addition of bay-infused salted caramel, soy sauce, cider vinegar, and pink peppercorns in the mix. Sign me up. I know, exactly, sign me up. <laughs> I'll take the lot. <laughs> <laughs> and on that sort of drool-worthy note, um, that's the end of our whistle stop sort of snapshot of cuisine trends for today. As I mentioned at the beginning, it, the session really is just intended as a snapshot rather than an exhaustive overview and a bit of a starter for 10 for us to have a bit of a chat now. But if you're a subscriber to Trend Hub and want inspiration from cuisine trends and guidance on how you can translate them into your innovation pipeline, then I really cannot suggest enough that you just take five or 10 minutes to just dive into the framework online, even if it's just with a cup of tea in the morning. There's so much there to get you going. Wow. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. My mouth is absolutely watering, which, of course, is what all around the world is all about chefs and influencers are really going to next level we can see that through the examples leveraging those building blocks of flavor for maximum impact but also sensory complexity as well but tapping into very much the vibe of the moment which is very apparent through everything that you've shared um, but while I've got you, got a few kind of thoughts or kind of questions and discussion points, really, just having absorbed all of that from for the first time. You've done a great job, I think, of summarising some of the, the overarching themes. But I just wanted to get 
a, a bit of a deeper view, if you like, on the common themes of cuisine manifestation from everything that you've shared today. Um, and I appreciate that's a summary in itself, but what do you see as some of those overarching themes? And that's a brilliant question, Charles. As you say, it's quite difficult to pinpoint just a few overarching themes and there's so much to talk about um, but there are definitely some recurring concepts and themes and trends that we do see coming through um, that I'd love to talk about. One is definitely this move that we're seeing towards really like simple paired back eating this approach to dining where it isn't about bells and whistles and things that are made to photograph well it's things that are made to be delicious like guaranteed deliciousness and I think it's one of the things that is really driving that renaissance of the Mediterranean style of eating things that are ingredient led maybe dishes that are only made with two or three things but the best quality of those things um and really champion you know a a guaranteed delicious time so that you don't need to worry about whether you're going to get what you need from the meal. You can just sit back and enjoy a convivial atmosphere and making memories with friends. It's probably the same reason we're seeing things like, you know, simple dishes like steak fried and yes, chicken and chips really shining at the moment yeah. too, because, you know, you know what you're going to get, you know, that it's going to be super tasty and it's going to be crowd pleasing no matter what combination of people you go, you go with. It's really interesting the point that you make actually about not necessarily having the correlation between the thing that looks most beautiful and the thing that's most delicious. And I think if I think back some of the um, the meals that I've had just over the course of the last six months, the things that have looked most incredible on the plate are not necessarily the things that really deliver the wow. I mean, there was a, like a slow cooked okra dish that I had the other day, and that was amazing in terms of flavour, but it was probably the ugliest thing on the table um so that's really interesting <laughs> yeah and I think well, it's really interesting you say that because we looked at it last year where we saw there was a lot of what we call beige food coming through yeah. so you know cassoulets and yeah. porridge and you know things that it, they had that that thread of deliciousness at the core so not don't worry about what it looks like worry about it being tasty and don't take any pictures it doesn't matter um but what's really interesting that's different this year is that it's not so much that kind of beiginess that's yeah. winning people over it's that things can have that flavor forward approach yeah. but still be vibrant yeah. and unique and amazing and use the best quality ingredient uh, ingredients and put loads of color on your plate i just want to take us back for a minute to a couple of your earlier slides and um the bit on the cuisine eras and the era of conscience uh conscious cuisine that we're in obviously we've we we identified that back 2019 2020 um and we've done the work on characterizing what that looks like and have continued to uh, track the evolution of that and 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 um we believe that we're still in that era which you've already yeah. shared with us today um the previous eras obviously had you know they were they're segmented in kind of chunks of time so what do you in your view what is the life that's left in this era do you think there's still more to come from uh, conscious cuisine oh my goodness yes absolutely i think it's actually more important than ever um because as we're seeing we talked about things like the italian korean the indian italian all that kind of fusion stuff that's coming through and we are in an era where fusion is not a dirty word anymore and that makes conscious cuisine more important than ever because the core tenet of conscious cuisine is that respect for technique and craft and the cultures that you're combining when you put different cuisines together on a plate. I mean, I was lucky enough on a recent trip to LA to go to Pija Palace, which is one of the kind of hot spots um, in the city at the moment. And if you told me five or 10 years ago, you're going to go to an Italian American Indian sports bar, <laughs> I would have said, oh, sure how that's going to work but then you get there and you eat things like dosa onion rings and tamarind chicken wings and pizza finished with chili chutney or melai rigatoni which i mentioned earlier and you just think actually why hasn't no one done this before yeah. <laughs> this is bloody brilliant but the reason that it works so well now where it might not have worked quite as easily before is that cooks are really um they're not shoehorning it they're not doing it for clickbait they're not doing it to get bums in seats there is authenticity at the core there is respect for those cultures and cuisines and they are making the best version of all of those things and using the best quality ingredients from all of those places and combining them seamlessly on a plate in a way that you go that works and not only does it work it respects the dishes that it's yeah. sort of paying homage to yeah 
I suppose that that kind of leads on to another um, question that I got really, which and you brilliantly articulated that fusion and the melding of cuisines is no longer a, a dirty word. From everything that you've seen, what would be a, a cuisine clashing combo that you'd love to see manifest? You know, in a world where we can have uh, Indian Italian and we can have um, Italian Korean. What are we not doing? What would you love to see and why? <laughs> In a world where anything is possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, do you know what? One thing that I would love to see more of, it wouldn't be fair to say that absolutely nobody is doing it, but it's it's nascent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Indian Mexican. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, it is, you, you might, it's one of those things, again, if you actually stop and think about it, there are, there are similarities between the cuisines, you know, like a curry isn't a million miles away from a gorgeous mole sauce, you know, a uh, chapati isn't a million miles away from a taco. Yeah. <laughs> there are lots of things where if you really think about it, and also, you know, yeah. the flavor profiles of the heat and the sweet and the sour that, that both both cultures really meld really beautifully, can come together really well. There's a there's a restaurant in, I think it's Bangkok that I follow that I'm a little bit obsessed with called Ms. Maria and Mr. Singh that is entirely Mexican Indian and it's at, helmed by Gaganan. And so we know that it's, <laughs> we know that he knows what he's doing. Um, but, you know, it really brings to life just how well this can work. They do things like pork vindaloo tacos, um, rotis with mole sauce for dipping, um, paneer al pastor, <laughs> Why not? You know, things like a samosa empanada hybrid, you know, there's no reason those things can't work beautifully together. And I'd love to see other people picking that up and really running with it. This can work incredibly well, but it can also not perhaps deliver for a myriad of different reasons. And I think I was going to ask you really what your thoughts were on what are some of the rules about breaking the rules? You know, uh, you've talked about, I think, clearly respecting um where that inspiration and and the and the cultural um the, you know the heritage has come from in creating those fusions is that is there anything else that you would you would share i think one thing that gets lost in all of the messaging around well wouldn't it be exciting to put these things together and oh i've heard that that's a hot ingredient from this place and this is a hot format from that place what gets lost sometimes is but will it taste good <laughs> so for me well, the best rule of thumb is make the thing and then close your eyes and eat it and see if you actually just think blimey that is the best tasting thing I've eaten this week or this month or this year and that's how you know it works I think that's that is it it sounds so simple but it's so important you know things just have to taste good they have to be respectful and authentic and all those important things but they just have to taste good as well (laughs) so yeah close your eyes and have a taste (laughs) <laughs> and I think my, my my last and uh, final question really is someone that sits um you know you and and uh, and and your team at the food paper we we, you know, we sit at the cutting edge of food and cuisine manifestation what are the cuisines and manifestations that you're particularly excited about seeing evolve that may well be nascent at the moment um yeah. and why I think for me, one that I'm personally excited about, it's not a country, but a region, I guess, but it's the cuisines of West Africa that we're seeing really yeah. come through um, yeah. on the global scene now. I think things like suya, which are those like meat skewers that are so addictive, <laughs> and jollof rice, which anybody who's tasted loves, <laughs> um, that sort of tomato lovely spiced rice. Um, they act as really brilliant gateways, and they've won a lot of people over to the side of these cuisines, but they are just, they're gateways, they're tipping, they're, you know, just the tip of the iceberg of all the really brilliant dishes and ingredients that we can explore in places like Nigeria and Ghana and Senegal. And, you know, they do such amazing things with stuff like plantains and cassava and okra, which aren't really typical ingredients in the day-to-day diet of someone in the UK or the States, for instance. So really taking inspiration from all the flavor and the dishes that they can create using those is something I think everybody should be thinking about. And then also there's all this kind of like amazing comfort food, things like akara, which are these bean fritters, um, puff puff donut. Like there's something for everybody essentially. And that includes fine dining. All you have to do is look at places like Ikoi, which we mentioned, but also Chijuru in London and somewhere like Dakar in New Orleans, which, um, you know, is helmed by a James Beard award winning finalist. Like it's just like these places can really bring to life for you that it's a type of cuisine that can work really, really well from street food and home cooking right through to really refined fine dining. And like I said, we're kind of just untapping the potential of it. 
um, and well, and the things that we can explore within it, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, definitely, and and also gives you the larder of ingredients that can also add that um, that twist to um, or bit of excitement uh, to a you know product LTO or something like that for really very mainstream and familiar flavor format uh, food yeah. formats you know to fried chicken as an example or absolutely uh, or pizza or, or whatever as well like so a burger that we saw earlier yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. absolutely exactly. there's there's a, a, so much to explore and a lot of really really great entry points for day-to-day diners fantastic thank you so much um Shikufa, for sharing um i guess the human narrative behind the um the uh, cuisine and ingredients and and gastronomy uh, foresight for 24 25 uh, hugely insightful thought provoking um, i'm sure everyone listening to us today is now uh, drooling and dying to get their their hands on uh, whatever food they have around them that uh, certainly worked up an appetite yeah. uh, welcome to my life charles looking yeah, at exactly. things all day every day <laughs> and i particularly love the conversation that was brilliant thank you so much for that thank you Really um, great to be here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you once again to our virtual stage talking about 2425. Thank you.